Hey everybody, John Malanka here, United Patients Group, and just finished another great podcast with uh, an old colleague that I've worked with for a while is Dr. Susan Trapp out of Colorado, and she specializes in terpenes. And little did I know, there are over 55,000 natural terpenes out in nature. Did not know that and uh, learned a lot today. Uh, she specializes in not only terpenes, but uh, plant microbiome as, as well as she's part of the genome project, human genome project. So a lot of great information. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, please like us if you like it, uh, comment in the thread, share as well as subscribe. And it does help us, helps our channel and helps get this information out to you as well. So enjoy and uh, stay tuned for Dr. Susan Trapp. Bye-bye. Hey everybody, John Malanka with United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. This segment is brought to you by Aspen Green. Aspen Green is just a handful of USDA certified organic hemp and CBD brands. And all of its hemp is grown from the perfect topography and climate found in Colorado. Check out why purity matters at aspengreen.com and follow them on social channels at Aspen Green CBD. Use promo code UPGCBD for 20% off. Hey everybody, welcome back. John Malanka, the United Patient Group. Be informed and be well. And I have an old friend on the show from Colorado, Dr. Susan Trapp. Hey Susan, how are you? Good, thank you. <laughs> Good. I'm glad 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 you're you're coming on my show here. Um, Susan is a specialist in, in terpenes, and so that's why I wanted to have her on. But let me read your your impressive bio. Susan has over 20 years of experience in the biotechnology field, both as a plant microbiome molecular biology re researcher and beyond the lab bench. I want to hear about that. She has held scientific management and early stage development positions within the biotech industry, academia, government, and startup community for our, from algae uh, biofuels to genomes. Uh, Dr. Trapp participated directly on the Human uh, Genome Project with Dr. Craig Venter early in her scientific career. And in her spare time, she enjoys educating beyond cannabis and the sciences. And she also enjoys teaching biology at her local community college, yoga, swimming, as well as disabled skiing, way to go. Uh, she's a lover of world travel adventures, uh, music, karma her cat, which I met last time, and she dabbles as a charcoal artist. So what a life, welcome, welcome, how are you? I'm good, thank you, Jad, I appreciate the, so, the bio, yeah. Well, I'll get into the story about your your old boyfriend, which I've shared with others others before, and how you got into cannabis. Well, I'll just get, let's get into this. So All microbiome, right. and I said, uh, and you said living living in Colorado is where you are right now. And you said, I said, how'd you get into this? And you said, well, I had a boyfriend who would say, oh, smell the terpenes in this THC. And you went as a scientist, like, wait a minute, those are that's not the terpenes in the THC. That's terpenes in the plant. And that's when you went into that. So we need to give your your ex boyfriend <laughs> some credit. Right, right, right. Yeah, he was just like. Life. He was like, this smells so great, this THC. And honestly, it was like a light bulb went on in my head at that time because I had been an academic who had studied terpenes, having nothing to do with the cannabis industry and really not even thinking about terpenes and how ubiquitous, I guess you could say they are in the world, right? And all of a sudden it was like, I'm like, because I studied terpenes, like I look, I studied horizontal gene transfer, kind of this genomic stuff, which I can come back to. But he, he was like, I'm like, you know, those, that THC doesn't smell. What you're smelling are terpenes because terpenes smell, right? And I, the light bulb went out in my head and I ended up going into the cannabis industry a couple of years later. And, and, so. and here we are. And so for a lot of our followers who may not know what terpenes are, but I, I guarantee you, you've all smelt a terpene before. It's like stopping to smell the roses. And that is a terpene. Smelling the lemons and limes are terpenes. Smelling the pine needles and Northern California, as well as in, in the Colorado mountains, those are all terpenes. And so can you share uh, your scientific definition of what, it, what a terpene is and how yeah. it's beneficial? I mean, it, I mean, everywhere you're turning nowadays, essential oils are a big thing. You know, um, I have one going on right here with some peppermint in. Um, and so I'm a fan, of, I'm a fan of scent. And so can you uh, talk sure. about terpenes? I can elaborate. So elaborate. um, <laughs> um uh, probably almost every scientific paper I've written has started out, or if you read, if you get into the world of terpenes, you, uh, the main sense is usually, you know, terpenes are the largest class of natural products and plants, or terpenes are the largest and most diverse class of natural products and plants. 
And uh, that kind of says it all right there, because, it, it, you know, unless you're a natural product, people get, begin to think you can kind of break down this sentence like grammar. And what are natural products? Well, natural products in the chemistry world are, are compounds derived from plants or compounds derived from nature, right? So an example I like to give is aspirin. Aspirin is derived from the bark, you know, the willow, bark of the willow tree. It is not a terpene, actually. It's an alkaloid. But nevertheless, there are just a few classes of compounds that uh, plants produce that we call what we call secondary metabolites. So they're not essential for life, um, as opposed to primary metabolites, for example, uh, sugar or carbohydrates or proteins. Those are important for all of the essential uh, mechanisms that have to go on in a plant or in some kind of uh, living organism. And so, you know, again, like the terpenes are the largest class of natural products in plants or in nature. So you understand something about natural products, but then it's like, well, why are they so large and why are they so diverse and why are they important, right? And so then you go back to, well, why are they diverse? But I'm giving you the mini lecture. <laughs> why are they diverse? Well, because they come from this um, uh, pathway that produced uh, very small compounds to very large compounds. Like we talked about this briefly before, yeah. and you can, we can go back to this. I won't get into it now, but, but right? But that's why, People in the cannabis industry have probably heard of monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes, which are C10 carbon compounds or C15 carbon compounds. But terpenes are this large class that build on these building blocks of five carbon compounds all the way up to C40 compounds or C80 compounds or essentially uh, polymers. So large polymers are rubber or latex. Those are made from the same pathway actually in plants. And so, you know, again, terpenes are the largest class of natural products and diverse products in plants. And part of the reason that's so diverse is because the pathway is so big and it produces all of these interesting metabolites, not only the ones that are of interest right now in the cannabis industry, yeah. but they've been of interest for a long time commercially for all kinds of things over the years. Um, and I will stop there and you can. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and so, you know, I learned something from you last time that there are more than 12. How, how many are there? Thousands. There's over, over in nature, uh, from a paper from 2008, there's like over 55,000 compounds. I was, I was going to say 75,000. I'm like, okay, maybe, yeah. maybe to say 75, but it, it, but I knew it was yeah. in the thousands, but, it, but 55,000 terpenes and, you know, and, and here in the cannabis industry, in, in, including me before I, before you and I met, I thought it was just, you know, the 10, 12, 15 that everyone talks about. And, and are terpenes used as a defense mechanism for the plants as well to keep, um, you know, yeah. I have, I have this beautiful um, citrus tree and then, you know, in in the springtime and summertime, you know, I'm, I'm bathing that thing up, the beautiful blossoms are coming on. And then I wake up in the morning and the, the, the deer have had gone to town, you know, and the same thing with the uh, agapanthin plants, you know, they come and nail those babies like they're little lollipops. And it's like, ugh. And, and everyone says, no, deer are not supposed to like citrus plants. And I said, well, they like my <laughs> citrus plants. So, so is there a defense mechanism? Yes, absolutely. So terpenes, again, back to that idea of secondary or primary metabolites. Uh -huh. Most, mo most, not all, but most terpenes um, are in this class of compounds that are not essential for life or secondary metabolites. So years ago, when I first got into the, uh, I was about to say cannabis, just the when I was, you know, we young, we young last, you know, getting yeah. my PhD and reading all the, the um, literature was like uh, terpenes were considered um, waste products of the plant. They had no idea what they were doing. And so to answer your question, yes, absolutely. That What are they doing? They're doing a variety of things because they're these very interesting small molecules that can do all kinds of things. But to answer your question, so they are, what they're doing is they're, protect, uh, they're doing a number of things, but plant defense and protection and attraction. Um, in a way, I like to think of them as the immune system of the plant, right? Uh, because they're doing all these things to keep that plant healthy and alive by attracting, you know, po being pollinated or yeah. uh, defense by uh, getting, uh, keeping predators, you know, I don't taste good to a deer, so keep them away, that kind of thing, right? And then you the, can the, actually... The, these deer like the taste, so, so right, they're, right, they're right. not supposed right. to. I need to go have a talk with them. 
Well, you're 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 experiencing evolution right in the making. Is yeah. that that I, I'm joking, but not. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. So why are we here? I mean, why you know you're talking about um, uh, health for nature, but what about health for human beings? Because uh, you know, bring bring our immune systems up, and you hear a lot about this with some doctors and scientists that I had on the show who work with families and 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 uh, children, and what they've done, they've had you know, all the different uh, varieties, I'll say, I won't say strains, but varieties and cultivars and they'll smell and they'll have their patient smell and go, you know what? I like number two better than number four. Let me go with number two. And does that have a lot to say, or is that just kind of folklore? Uh, I, I, you know, the hardcore scientists, I got to play yeah. the middle ground. Um, yeah. But so let me take a step back. So, um, Again, so these are these secondary metabolites of plants, right? And so they have this protection for the plant. So think about that because they're protecting the plant from pathogens, from microbes, from uh, bacteria, uh, right? From bugs, beetles, the works, yeah. like the works. And so when you think about that and then you apply it to human health, it's really the same thing. You've got these compounds that are, I'm, I've started calling them the antis, like, right? So antimicrobial, antibacterial, uh, antifungal, you know, uh, um, anti-inflammation. And so those same compounds that are helping the plant are also sometimes helping humans, right? Because when yeah. we get a bacterial infection, you want something that's an antibacterial. Um, so I like to kind of, in a way, start there with, you know, understanding what terpenes are doing. So yes, of course, they're helping the plant, but um, we have essentially a synergistic relationship with plants. And they're also helping us just because those compounds are in the plants. And that's kind of the place to start. But to answer your question, uh, you know, that, that's more of what I, my understanding of kind of like muscle testing and yeah. naturopaths, right? And, and there's definitely some truth to that, even scientifically for sure, right? But we can, we can uh, um, go a little deeper. So if, if we're talking just about a cannabis strain, that cannabis strain probably has 30 to 40 terpenes in it. And, and so then you have your major and your minor terpenes. Mm -hmm. So we're, we've become quite familiar with the major ones. We don't know the minor ones that well, but those major ones like pinene, limonene, uh, myrtine. Can, can you go down for, for our listeners? I know <laughs> you and I both know this, but I think you know, our listeners of, of some of the, the main, you know, you name five, you, you know, linalu, pinene, myrcene. Um, uh, yeah, caryophylline and humulene are probably... It's probably like, those are the top six, right? And and I think the majority of there, there so and there is scientific evidence that they benefit us medically for sure. But a lot of that evidence, scientifically, it, it we're um, constrained or you know strained in the same way the cannabis industry is. Although it's not necessarily illegal to study can or terpenes per se. Um, terpenes have a long history. They're very well understood chemically and um, they've been around a long time, but we've actually primarily uh, utilized terpenes for household goods and um, commercial purposes like mint, that, you know, mint your toothpaste, pine saw. Pine saw, I knew that, yeah, that, that was, I, right? I was always smelling that. Yeah, pine saw, so that pine cleaning smell, so that, you know, it's, ca it's, it's caustic, but uh, or flowers or perfume or cosmetics. So linalool, right, it is the, one of the main uh, uh, terpenes that makes uh, lavender smell the way lavender smell, right? And so that's used in perfumeries and in cosmetics. And it, it has uh, more benefit than just its aroma and smell. It has a lot of benefit for right, our body and mind. I think well, you, gave, I, me oh, that. I, I, you I, gave me that quote. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, good. But, but okay. it, re, you know, little, little and lavender, as well as roses, bring me back uh -huh. to, you know, my, my grandmother's. And yeah. it brings a common feeling to me when I smell, I mean, every time I smell lavender, my grandmother's, every time I walk by, I mean, I, if you followed me with a hidden camera and I walk by Rose Garden, I will always stop to smell the roses. And, yeah. uh, and for that reason, it just brings me back to the place so the, so the, the, the memory, re, uh, you know, it uh, uh, has a reaction in my memory. And so why, since we've been using these for, and they've been in our medicine cabinets for centuries, um, you know, the indigenous people have been using this forever. Our ancestors have been using this forever. Why are we seeing such a, um, a, a, an upstart right now, again, with 
with terpenes and scents. Um, uh, you know, of course, I'm certain the uh, essential oil market is a multi-million dollar market right now. And then cannabis. I mean, a lot of, for a while there, I was we we'd go to um, conference. I haven't been to a conference now, one because of COVID, but there would always be these new terpene companies that are popping up that um, you would smell the oils. I'm assuming like the essential oils that they were mixing in with other um, uh, tinctures. Are they still doing that? Wait, I'm not sure I'm following. Well, you can go. So <laughs> you and I could go now buy t- 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 just terpenes. Terpene. Oh uh, yeah. You know, okay. and you would smell these things with like, oh my gosh, this really smells like that or really smells yeah. like this. And yeah. then what they're doing, they were they were selling the terpenes as a side thing and almost being a compound pharmacist and mi- mixing them into yeah. into the uh, into the products. Is that still yeah. popular? So yeah, absolutely. So um, again, the industry has been around for for a while, like commercially, and uh, like the cosmetic industry has known about terpenes for a long time. Um, right. And because they, they, you know, they're looking for the perfect, you know, uh, perfume smell. Yeah. yeah. Perfume. Yeah. Perfect scent. Um, and so this isn't a new thing, but, but yes, in regards to the react, because cannabis has is, uh, become such a, a big industry. Right. And uh, um, initially it was, re- you know, recreation and, you know, higher THC. Then we began to realize that there are other, compounds in there, other cannabinoids that are of interest and also have benefit, you know, I, I, uh, AKA uh, CBD or cannabidiol, right? Uh, um, and then they were like, well, there's these other compounds in there and they're actually also having an effect on you. So that's uh, sort of, I guess, I don't know if I want to say a resurgent, but that's where I, I personally think the spike in um, what I like to call terpenes have sort of gotten into the limelight right in the news is is definitely uh cannabis plays a role um but the hops industry for example or brewing beer hops is essentially um uh, a cousin to cannabis Mm -hmm. and also full of terpenes and you know you know ode to the is that what i should say ode or you know praise to the (laughs) praise to the um to the um, micro brew industry the beer beer guys because i i have you have you smelt the hops where you do that you know, oh yeah. I mean that. It's, um, it's, I'm, all, it's I, I full of terpenes. Love the so. terpenes. I'm I'm <laughs> big into cooking as well, and rosemary and the sage, and garlic. You know, I mean, just to smell a sprig of sprig of rosemary. Um, I mean, it just it just takes you back. And so, how are these beneficial on the on the body? And then, what does it do to the mind to to to, I guess, bring the body back to balance? And it's just another part. Is this another part of the, the entourage effect um, that um, goes on? Yeah, and so um, I, I I like to think of it more. I like to talk about it as in concert or synergy. Yeah, in concert, um, yeah. But so so if, if we're talking about cannabis and uh, everything it brings to the table, so right, you have cannabis, you have uh, THC, CBD, you have the cannabinoids. So THC and CBD fall under um, that category of compounds, but then yeah. you have these terpenes, right? However, when we talk about the entourage effect and all of the benefits that it medically benefit, then you start to think about also our body, right? And so that's where this idea of the endocannabinoid or the ECS system. So we have, we have these receptors that like back in the 60s without going into the details, right? We discovered, we've, we've, uh, there is a scientist you know, who is like, well, you know, since we have this endocannabinoid system, we have these receptors and we know that uh, the pop, you know, the, the cannabinoids bind to this, what are they? And that's essentially how he began to discover the endocannabinoid system and discover that it's one of the largest systems in our body and that we have receptors both, uh, you know, all over in our ba- brain and our body that bind to these compounds. But what that also means is we actually have internal compounds like, and, you know, so we also produce, um, uh, um, gosh, I'm, I'm, uh, we also produce, I know I'm, I'm blinking. Um, it's your um, birthday in a couple of days. You have that in your mind. <laughs> a birthday and Christmas. Uh, but yeah. yeah, so we produce endocannabinoids ourselves, right? Mm-hmm. And so you've got, it, it becomes a, a very interesting, complex system of what's going on. It's not as simple as an entourage effect. They, um, but there's definitely, um, 
you get cannabinoids binding to these receptors, then you have actually other systems in your body. Terpenes, probably there's at least one terpene that we know of that binds to the CB2 receptor, and that's caryophylline. But there's lots of terpenes, and they're small molecules, and they there's a lot of science behind uh, how they're working or the chemical system that they're working with, the chemical messenger system. Um, I will stop there and let you ask so, another so, question. So it's not, it's, not the, it's not the THC that I'm smelling, right? It, exactly. It's not the <laughs> THC, but, but it's the THC you're feeling. It is a <laughs> THC you're feeling too. And so with, with, so terpenes alone could do have healing benefits is what I'm hearing yes. as well. Yes. Yeah. So they, on their own and in cannabis. So uh, some of the effects, uh -huh. so when you pick your, whatever strain you choose, uh -huh. uh, if we go back to cannabis and you, you like a strain that makes you feel energized, for example, right? Some of that energetic feeling or that uplifting feeling, that is not probably the THC or the CBD. Um, that's where terpenes uh, play a role in cannabis and cannabis, you know, strains. Some of the effects that you're getting back to the rosemary and the lavender tea, right? So when you know when you have uh, those compounds in your cannabis, the linalool or the limonene, yeah. right? These or the geraniol for the rose, um, that's what's making you feel potentially uplifted or calm or less anxious, right? And another one that everybody talks about, like, is um, couch lock. When you have a strain, you know, that you smoke, and I'm I'm not a big smoker, so I don't know my strains very well. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I'm guessing here. Uh, Gorilla glue. Maybe that's a couch lock type, right? <laughs> but the bottom line is uh, some of the effects that you're getting from that. I, I think, think, I, I, I think the, <laughs> uh, a strain tr train, re train wreck. Has train wreck? That. I mean, some of the that's a whole other story on, right. on I, I uh, you know, we did an article about changing the names of these strains and uh, from cat piss to the shit that killed Elvis to earwax <laughs> to uh, green crack to, you know, all these things. Anyway, we did an article on this and I had, uh, I've had one hate, hate letter, hate mail letter. And it was from a major publication. Uh -oh. <laughs> and they said, yeah. And I said, oh my, I mean, first I was excited that, that this major publication found us. This is about 2011. I'm like, oh my gosh, this ma magazine that I've been following since I've you know, been in high school and college wrote to me and it was, you know, they, they blasted me for this. And I said, listen, I'm not saying anything's wrong with the, with the marketing names or the recreation market versus uh, uh, medicinal market, but who our demographic is, they, they're looking at this. And for the doctors that we work with, it's kind of hard to recommend, okay, uh, Mrs. Trapp, I want you to go down and get, uh, go down to your local dispensary and get cat piss. It's like, you know, yeah, I, mean, I, I think there's a market for everything. And so I, I'm not, I'm, I would, I'm not bad mouthing the market, but I just think sometimes the names that they come up with and a lot of times the strains I've been into the dispensaries where I'm like, that's not that. Or I've been in, been in friends who are growers and they said, I'd like to sell you this, it's, it's product A. And they say, oh, we already have product A. And it's like, well, not like this. And they smell it and they said, ooh, okay, we'll take it. We're just going to rename it. And so that's the thing that, that frustrates me with this industry. And hopefully it'll get to the point where um, it'll be a little more legitimized for, for all. You know? Um, well, I mean, that brings up, uh, I mean, that, that's a great point. Or, um, and, uh, you know, my background is genomics. So yeah. genetics, right? And so, uh, the genomics and geneticists who are in the cannabis industry, I think we all kind of agree that down, down the road, you know, we're going to be using more scientific uh, terminology, right? Because it's going to, it's going to help uh, with exactly that. You know, you have no idea really what you're getting. And part of the reason you don't know is the environmental conditions that they're grown under, right? You can't necessarily, unless you really do indoor grow all the time under the exact same specific conditions, um, are you going to actually get the same thing every time and then plant themselves um, um, as you breed them, you know, you're expressing different genes. Um, and so for now, it's okay. But down the road, I suspect that uh, we'll get a little bit more scientific. Yeah. At least the scientific community will get more scientific uh, about these strains um, that are being used in the cannabis industry. Um, so it's that touches I mean, upon a, a, a big... Same. 
sorry, you, you and I can have the same seat. I can grow out here in California, you grow in Colorado. We can have our friend over in Florida do the same and they with the same seed and they all come out different. Um, right. And hopefully it'll be that way. Like you said, um, like if you're getting a, a, a prescription from your, from your doctor or pharmaceutical, you know, it's the same here or Colorado or Florida or, or up in New York. Um, and they even, I, 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 we worked with a scientist, actually a doctor uh, in, in Florida, and they did a study down, I think, University of Florida or Florida State, where they took off clones off the mother plant, and they grew them in different you know, environments. Environment. You know, different, different pH of the water, different, you know, my technique is different than your technique. You might put a little secret sauce, I might do something else. And the same clone that came off the mother plant had different terpene levels, cannabinoid levels, uh, and testing levels. And so it just hopefully one day it'll be that way. You have cancer, take this. You have diabetes, take this. You have sleep issues, take that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not a one size fits all yet. And so, you know, I learn every day and, and uh, you know, learning about these terpenes. I mean, I didn't know there were 55,000 terpenes, you know, that when you and I first met uh, this past year in, and, you know, so, so thank you for, for sharing on, on all you do. I didn't get into the cannabis industry per se to be smoking and getting high. I got gotcha. into the cannabis industry because I have this specialty that, you know, that's very somewhat rare and, you know, yeah. and that is uh, an understanding for terpenes and, and yeah. terpenes were, were a very small community of scientists in general, I think until yeah. uh, the cannabis industry. So, you know, uh, <laughs> no, no, I have, a, I have a friend who's been on the show and his family is, you know, a very, very strict. And um, uh, he went to some major uh, Ivy League university, he and his sister, and he went the cannabis route. I said, what'd your parents think? One, because of his background. And uh, he said, oh, it took me a while. I had to talk with my dad. And when I started talking to my dad, who was an entrepreneur as well, um, dad, he said, mom, dad, just stay there. Don't say anything. I'm going to share my side. Then we can talk. And when they started sharing in his passion and the numbers of potential, his father says, well, son, how can I help you? <laughs> you know, so that's, you know, that's why, I mean, my biggest fear, my, my dad passed a couple of years before Corinne and I started United Patients Group. And I'm thinking, how do I tell my mom, you know, how do I tell my mom, you know, it's like, you know, hi, mom, you know, I've gotten out of this and I'm, and I'm in, in the cannabis industry now, but uh, shared and she, and, you know, to get that stamp of approval. Yeah. Uh, you know, of well, God, your, your dad would be so proud of you. You know, it's like, oh, okay, good. No, I, can, I can do it. So anyway, well, I didn't, like, want, to get, I didn't hey, want to get personal with, with your like, parents. Hey, or dad. Something. <laughs> no, yeah. that's fine. Uh, you know, my dad's a, a scientist as well. And yeah. so it's, it's, been, uh, it's been great, honestly, because yeah. uh, you have someone who has a different kind of, he's a psychiatrist, but he's done a lot of research. He's done yeah. a lot of clinical studies, a lot of clinical trials. And, and so it's been fantastic because it's a nascent young industry. And my background is genomic. You know, I worked on the Human Genome Project. It's not clinical science. And there's an art to every kind of science. I think people in general think if you're a scientist, you know everything. And you do not, right? <laughs> um, and so uh, it's been great having him because it's like, what do you think of this? And I get a very strong review on like this science or this trial was poorly done it was biased it was x it was wow. y it's z um but also i also have to say uh um over the last couple of years he um has become warm <laughs> to to the industry right and and yeah. then I, I i can further say like well i'm agnostic anyway because i'm passionate about terpenes as well. so you know yeah. terpenes are everywhere and they aren't necessarily it, you know like I, my, my big thing is like the cannabis industry thinks they invented terpenes and they didn't they've been in your medicine cabinet and your spice cabinet for centuries centuries, centuries. um as a matter of fact yes uh terpene turpentine terpene turpentine is like the one of the first uh, terpenes that was uh chemically characterized the the terp the terpenes that were in turpentine and this is something i i looked up not too long ago for another interview and turpentine or turpentine was like this elixir a hundred years ago that we we the doctors were using and giving everybody to drink turpentine <laughs> clean, um, clean clean you out huh yeah yeah clean, a variety clean. it had it had a number of uses um for sure uh, i i didn't i did not know that 
and, and the doctors at the time, at least the little article I read said, uh, they know it had pretty toxic effects, or, you know, or, like, but I guess it's, it, you know, some of it did have some benefit for certain yeah. things. And so it was used for certain kinds of, uh, you know, medical indications. And it was also used uh, that, that same compound, like, which is identified from pine trees or pine resin. Pine resin has, have these type of turpentine compounds in it, pinenes mm -hmm. and some other ones. And um, that uh, they used that back in the, uh, the Greek and Roman history as well as a medical well, elixir of sorts. So terpenes have been around a long time. Um, it, well, it's, yeah. good, it's good to see a lot of these things are coming back that have been in the closet for centuries and centuries and they're being used again today. I mean, cannabis being one, not, I mean, yeah, centuries, but since 1937 being banned and hopefully, you know, it, it, it will be looked about, looked at upon as, as a, another um, form of, of healing. Um, you know, I'm a fan of, you know, it doesn't, I'll never say the word cure and I never want to give anybody false hope, but I've seen the benefits of this plan. I've seen uh, it work. I've seen it not work. Um, but if you can use it as, as an arsenal or another tool in your tool belt and tacking ailment or whatever you're trying to, to uh, conquer, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of that as well. Um, I was going to ask you a question that I didn't want to interrupt you there. Um, shoot, it'll come back to me. It's like you, well, I'm getting ready while, to celebrate your while, birthday too. While, while it's coming back, I'm just going to put my list, my disclaimer out there that I'm not yeah. telling people to go and drink turpentine. So, so, yes, yes. I want, to, I, I but, want to make sure we know this, right? Uh, and, like, and, and, that, and that's I'm, where I was going. I'm giving you some historical information yes. here. Like, okay. So, yeah. so that, that's exactly where I was going. And I didn't want to okay, cut you great. off on that. And so I was going to ask you about, um, there are, are there terpenes? Because when, um, before Corinne was, was ill, uh, and then while she was ill, you know, we use frankincense, you know, there's some articles. I mean, when you get diagnosed with something as, as, as severe as cancer, you will try anything and everything. And, mm -hmm. uh, that, that kind of makes sense. You know, I know when my father-in-law became ill, um, I came across a study that showed canned asparagus, not whole foods, not farmer's market, not you know, whatever, but canned asparagus. So I said, do you like asparagus? Yeah, why? You're going to eat it. You know, I think we came across a study that shows strawberries. You like strawberries? Yeah, why? You're going to eat it. And so the same thing when it came to um, cancer, you know, we saw some studies with, with, with frankincense. And so it's funny, Corinne, <laughs> Corinne was like, oh my gosh, she goes, it tastes like turpentine is what she would say. And really? So, yeah. Well, that, and, that, and, that, that, that's right. That's a hint right there, just like the question you asked about 20 minutes ago of like smelling and yes. So right, so probably you know I don't know much about frankincense. I I haven't had the uh, yeah. I need to go look look it up. Um, but but um, I mean if it does smell a little bit like turpentine, I'm sure it's got those same compounds in it. Yeah, and but, right. But I would and, take a spoonful. You know, I do. I would did every did everything yeah. by her side. Let's do it. Let's do it. And so, are they safe? That's my next question. So when you're talking about turpentine, I was like, I'll be damned. That's exactly what, how Corinne described the frankincense that we were taking yeah. a teaspoon a day. You know, um, can you take the, uh, the, the peppermint, can you put it in food or is it just better in the, in the diffuser? Yeah, great. That's a great question. And uh, in general, so for those people who are in the cannabis industry, like one of the, I would say forefathers or fathers of the cannabis industry is Dr. Russo. He's written a lot of articles yeah. that have been around for a while. Um, so uh, in general, terpenes are considered safe, like they're gross, right? They're generally recognized as safe. However, um, nothing is always safe. It depends on your dose. And I think that's where we have to be very careful. Uh, uh, you know, salt water, if you drink too much salt water, can be dehydrating and not safe, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. And so my, my point is, is that um, in general, these are considered safe, but you have to be careful. So like what's happening right now is uh, because people have started to learn about terpenes, they just think terpenes have these effects. More is better and more is not always necessarily better. It depends on what it is that you're trying to treat. Yeah. So back to the story of cancer and cannabis or cancer and frankincense or cancer and terpenes, right? Um, uh, so I'm going to talk about Taxol or um, Taxol is a drug that's used in uh, 
for cancer, and it's been around a good 20, 25 years already, I think. Taxol is made, it's a derivative of uh, a, a C20 terpene, a diterpene, so C20 diterpene compound uh, called, uh, uh, yeah, uh, taxidine. I am, I, like Christmas is almost here and my yeah. brain I think is almost done. I think we're all um, out. I, yeah, <laughs> I, I think we're all there, especially thinking, uh, uh, you know, that we've all been inside for COVID and now we're on, I mean, I have my friends, all my friends' kids are like, we're out of school for two weeks. The parents are like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like, I know you've already been at home. Now, what are we going to yeah, do? But yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. we can't go out and running around there too. Um, so but, go, go on. But, but so one of the most successful uh, stories or successful chirping uh, drug stories, right, is uh, uh, this compound called taxidine, which is derived from the Pacific yew tree. The Pacific yew tree is a type of evergreen. It's more of a shrub than it is like a, a tall tree. pine tree. Yeah. But nevertheless, uh, they discovered that that had potent anti-cancer effects. And so the derivatives of that that have been synthesized in a lab are uh, Paxitaxol, Taxol. Those are the drug names uh, for this compound. Okay. And my point is, is that uh, it's a chemotherapeutic. And although I'm, I'm not, I, I'm the PhD, not the yeah. MD, MD, like treating people with, yeah. for, for cancer, um, I'm, I'm fairly certain that you're taking that chemotherapeutic, that taxol, that uh, paxitaxol in high amounts, just like you would for, a, a, you know, chemotherapy. Yeah. And so in that case, right, it, it's doing the same thing that any other chemotherapeutic would do. It's killing cells, I believe, you know, how it kills yeah. them. We won't go into that right now. And so, you know, high is better because you're trying to kill cells, but you're also killing good cells as well as bad cells. Oh. Yeah. Right. So, that, that, that's, so with the natural terpenes, just like, cause I know chemotherapy goes after all cells, good and bad. THC cannabis goes out, the, the studies show that it's going after just the bad cells. And so with this terpene that you're talking about, is it, is it mimicking and mirroring a, a, a chemotherapy type of approach? You know, I'm ma I'm making that assumption, so again, okay. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go there. Not I need sure. to research that more. To uh, yeah. I, I I made that assumption that that's the case. Excuse um, me. Yeah, no, that's all right. Uh, but my point my point is is that uh, um, in general they're considered safe if you're taking them in the amounts that they're, they're naturally provided to you. Yeah. Like for example, your favorite herb, rosemary. Right, rosemary has a blend of terpenes in it. Right. And uh, it, it, and think about it, your spices, you don't put much spice in your food. If you over spice, it doesn't taste good. Right. So those are still those terpenes. So the, my point is, is that um, most of the time they're generally recognized safe in, you know, basic dosing, uh, you know, whatever is natural for the herb or a little bit more. But it's not like where the cannabis industry is. With, for example, with THC, more is better. Let's get really high. And yeah, I and yeah. I get it that the cannabis industry has gone from kind of that uh, point of view, and we're yeah. starting to really hone in on the medical benefits of of cannabis and THC and CBD. So t or terpenes are, are no different. And I don't know if I'm, I'm looking at your face, so I'm not sure. Did no, I, no, I was going to ask answer you. That? You, uh, you, did I confuse you? Because if I no, 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 because because I'm a fan of less is more, okay. and and I and I share that all the time because even too much water could, can be bad for you. I mean, I've had it where I've, I mean, I remember I came off a, a years ago, I came off a big bike ride and I, when I got back, I had been drinking so much water that I sweat every, all my electrolytes out and I was shaking and I was with a buddy of mine who was a doctor and we pulled up to this restaurant and he pulled a salt shaker off of the table, opened it up, put it in my hand and says, just start licking it like a cow. You need to bring that back. And that was the first time I thought, that I found out like, oh my gosh, too much water can also be bad. Um, so the same thing with, with cannabis, you know, you, you and people uh, that I talked to, you know, my loved one has cancer, we just want to blast it as much. And I said, please know, uh, you know, and I'm not a doctor, but t common sense, more is not always better. It's like you and I, I were both athletes, you know, I could run, I ride every day, everything else I get, but am I ready for a marathon? No, I'd have to go train. So I'm not going to just walk out my front door and go run a full marathon right now. Um, yeah, I need to get my body, you know, into that movement, you know, say, hey, okay, here's 5k, let's do 10k and then get to, the, get to the long distance. I wouldn't just come out of the gate and do that. Uh, I hope that made sense. Um, no, it did, it did. The question yeah. I was going to ask is, are there, um, can you talk about the, the healing benefits at some 
terpenes possess. Like uh, for stress and anxiety, a lot of people go to the linalu, which is the lavender. And you can just go to, get down and get lavender plant and do it yourself. You know, they, you know, some of these nice hotels will bring you a little squirt, 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 squirt to put on your, on your pillow. Say here, here's a little lavender. And then, so, you know, they want you to have a nice calming, calming evening, at, at, you know, at, at, during your stay. And so are there proven terpenes? Can you talk about, um, um, yeah. um the, the science behind some of these terpenes and, and the set, the scents that are being put off? Yeah. So, uh, absolutely. So they have an effect. So like, again, back to the cannabis, when you, when you smoke a strain or take a strain and they, they have the terpenes in them, they're, you know, not only do you have the THC and the CBD, but you're getting a specific effect. So for example, like you asked, uh, like if you want kind of to feel uplifted, um, I, I have not experienced this, but I'm, I'm unique when it comes to cannabis, but I know that people like smoke cannabis and it makes them energized and they want to go ski or I hear, vacuum right so i would imagine if you would, uh, yeah one that you know which is probably energizing as well as focus yeah. right and so that energizing is most likely i mean it's a blend of terpenes but the one that is getting um in the limelight is is limonene it's uplifting it makes you feel um happy it up, uplifts your mood and i have done a little bit of research on that in regards to the literature, uh, the scientific literature, and is, is that really true? And uh, one example that I came up with, uh, it's called the Journal of Retailing. So it's well known in the, um, in the retail industry that when you smell something like citrus or grapefruit or just, you know, oranges, right? And, and you probably, you know, have done that yourself. You do, you feel energized, uplifted, you know, I've been- You wanna buy things, huh? <laughs> Apparently so. And they yeah. did a study. This was in the Journal of Retailing 2014. There was a study done on over 400 um, uh, participants, right? And they they compared a, a, just a basic citrus scent. I think it had limonene and some other things in it. I don't think they got specific to just limonene itself, but a basic citrus scent to it. It was a, I think it was a citrus basil, a more complex um, smell, a more yeah. complex citrusy smell. And they saw an effect of like more, more buying, like 20% more buying with the basic citrus wow. scent over the complex citrus scent, right? And there's, there are other studies and I'm just getting into like really beginning to understand the medical benefits, like going to the literature. Um, so another example and um, uh, uh, was a study that was done in Japan on, on I think specifically, I, I, I believe that one was specifically limonene. Mm -hmm. And I believe the delivery was um, aromatherapy or um, aromatic, um, right. I, uh, I can't think of it. There's a scientific term for it. Um, and they were able to demonstrate, it was a very small study. I don't know if there's been that many since then, but they were able to demonstrate that the people or, or the, the participants again, who had the uh, limonene um, aromatherapy actually they, they improved their mood. And this was a depression study. Right? So it's literally just citrus and depression. And so there is basic research there. And this is a kind of a, a great question to ask because, um, but the, we, we still need the clinical trials as well, right? Uh, yeah. So um, and it, then it gets complicated, whether you want to just focus on terpenes or a specific strain, a strain that, ha you know, cannabis strain that has terpenes in it. So limonene is a great example of that. Um, Linalu is another great one. I honestly haven't read that many studies on it, like basic research. Um, but there is a lot of in regards to, so uh, the essential oil, lavender essential oil, one of the main compounds that is making you feel uh, and, uh, less stressed and calm is linalu. And I think there are some other compounds in there as well that uh, I won't go into, yeah. but uh, right. So that is definitely has a calming effect. Um, and that's, uh, I'm hesitating because I, there's um, more basic research that needs, needs to be done, but th th there, there's studies out there. And um, another one with terpenes would be uh, the immune system. Yeah. Uh, so I've been recently looking into this and starting to do research on uh, uh, the immune system in terpenes. And there is definitely some basic research there. And there's actually some, some really uh, sound science on what these terpenes are doing 
and how they're um, interacting with like essentially the cytokine storm that I won't go into. So, so there is science there. It's not yeah. at the level of clinical, you know, trials, um, you know, and that I think, um, yeah, I, I was about to say that's kind of the difference between the sound science and being in the science community versus, you know, you hear like little Lou tea, good for, yeah. you know, little ladies drink it and, you know, they all feel calm there's science to it, but we still have to kind of tease that information out. And again, some of that basic research is there from the years of commercial benefit, like the perfumery industry knows this, the retail industry to some extent knows this, but they're, you know, they have their own interest in what they're interested in looking in. If that, if that makes sense. It, it makes sense. And ba back to the retail, I was laughing when you're telling a story. I remember my brother and I, uh, uh, we were in a store, there's you guys in the nineties. And it was summertime and I walked out of there with a <laughs> sweater and I'm like, what the hell do I need a sweater for in the middle of July? And you know what it was in that section of the store where the sweaters are, it was, they cranked on the air condition. We were in shorts and t-shirts and I was freezing my butt off and I walked out with the sweater and I said, oh my gosh, they got me. It works. It works. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, um, is there, so for our listeners that, uh, one or maybe into essential oils, which I'm a fan of essential oils. Are there certain things to look at? Do they look for like a USDA certification? Um, because I know like the CBD market, there's probably a lot of crap out there that that's not safe uh, one to smell or even in, in ingest. And, I'm, and I'm, you know, uh, again, what Susan and I are talking about here is a not to replace a one-on-one. -on -one. This is for informational purposes only. So I'm I don't want to put any words in your mouth. To, oh, Susan said I can ingest this. And next thing you know, they're sick. And so, uh, but are there things, because I know when we, we, Corinne and I were going through her ailment, I would look for everything that was organic, or USDA certified organic uh, over something that I would, you know, buy from uh, overseas. Is that something that um, you would agree upon or not? Or what, what, are there any warnings you have out there for terpenes? Again, in general, they're recognized safe, but uh, right, this grass, but there are some terpenes that are, um, there are a few that, that are not considered safe. And I, I don't know those off the top of my head. They're not no, ones no, that yeah. are, they're not ones that are super common, uh, that uh, in at least uh, that come to the limelight in the cannabis industry. Um, so they exist. Uh, in regard to like organic terpenes, um, that is a great question because uh, I don't think the field has gotten that sophisticated yet. Um, and I, um, what do I wanna say here? So uh, when you're talking about something like isolating terpenes, right? I think what you're more, what we're, uh, as a scientist, what you're more concerned about is how they're extracted and what's in, in the extraction. So there are various ways to extract terpenes um, and some are going to have less solvents than other. And I, you know, I guess the cannabis industry is the same way. So that's probably more important than whether it's organic or not. Um, another whole area, uh, it, this is a bit of a sidetrack, but in organic chemistry, you have a stereochemical molecule. So you have molecules that look exactly the same, but they're essentially uh, mirror images of each other, you know? Um, which I won't get into, but like, you know, so you could have almost a limonene, you know, right-handed and a limonene left-handed. And so- And, and they're complete op opposite? Well, yeah, so they're not the same, right? My yeah, left yeah. Hand, like, right, so yeah. this would be the ring, but you've got some kind of R group off that ring, okay. right? So you, you can't, they aren't superimposable, right? They're actually yeah. different compounds. And what that means is, so that compound, if you, you know, this is the idea of, a, a, a ligand in the receptor or a compound in a receptor and that it binds, like we've all heard about CB1 and CB2. Well, it's only one version of that compound typically, you know, can fit into that, that receptor. So that's this idea of the chemical, the locking key, yeah. right? So you have, uh, I'm going to get these backwards because I have dyslexia, but uh, uh, yeah. So you have the lock, right? Uh, that, that is the enzyme and the key. So the compound, whether it's CBD, THC, or a terpene or whatever, fits into this. This is the classic thing in basic biology that everybody yeah. learns. And so um, uh, terpenes, because they're small molecules, and you sometimes have stereochemistry, so one will fit and one won't. 
Um, and so that becomes important. So, you know, maybe, uh, so there's a lot of side questions around answering that question is what I'm getting at. And if I, I getting the classic scientist, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's not, I'm not giving you the direct answer you want. Um, but, but more importantly is, is understanding that kind of stuff is how it was extracted, you know, where the solvents left in it, um, you know, um, uh, um, uh, you know, it, is this synthetically produced? Because then you may have what we call a racemic mixture of both right-handed and left-handed. Only one of those are going to be active. The other one isn't. So then you have less than you think you do, right? Those are the kind of things that are um, actually important. Um, and, and granted, so I, I, I'm the kind of person, I think if I have cancer, um, knocking yeah i don't talk right? like that I, I i'm superstitious like that so i whenever right. i talk cancer right. i talk uh well i like or all organic um as well but yeah. you know really what you under you want to understand what's in that compound and how it was made it's not as simple as organic is better so even even in the cannabis industry it's it might be organic but uh or or not organic but it may be like what's in the soil because yeah. the plant actually can absorb compounds from the soil, right? And so sometimes it's not the matter, I mean, a compound is a compound is a compound in organic chemistry. But when it's been extracted from a plant and uh, you know, you may, uh, th there are other things that are in that plant, right? That may or may not be that healthy for you. Uh, but in my opinion, and this is just my opinion, genetically modified crops, for example, right? Because you end up with a soil that's not really super rich, right? And so um, is it the is it the GMO, Yeah. right? <laughs> or is it just a plant that doesn't, it's not really nutrient rich and so it doesn't produce really a nutrient rich product? Product. You know, I, I talk about that all the time that, that I, if, especially with the hemp industry now and, and hemp being known as mop weed where they suck up all the, toxins and pesticides and metals, you know, from, from the ground. Um, you know, I like the companies that whenever I share about what to look out for is look for the companies that do soil seed to sale. And I, they test the soil first to make sure it doesn't have any of the, the toxins in, then they use, then they plant with the seed. And then the sale is, you know, the final product for the, for the, the, the consumer to put into their body. Is there um, we kind of talked about this, but and is, is, are there uh, unsafe amounts of terpenes that we can put in our body? Um, you know, John, know. you're asking me difficult questions. Okay, never mind. <laughs> no, well, you know, no, and, no. And, I, I'm sure there are. That's yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know what those are, yeah. but, you know, so, but I'm, I'm sure there are. And again, back to thinking about your spices, yeah. rosemary, basil, uh, even lavender and the yeah. smell. Terpenes are in very... They're, they're a very small amount. I think it's like two or three percent of like the cannabis plant. They're meant to be there in small amounts. Herbs yeah. are there in small amounts. You don't need a lot of it to have an effect. So more, more is not always better. So gotcha. I, don't, I don't know what that range is. And actually, I think um, uh, very few people do. It's, uh, it, it's parts per million and it's very dependent. It's dependent on like if you're isolating a terpene, is it a yep. blend of terpenes? Is it an essential oil? Because then you have a number of terpenes and you have a you know a specific blend that may be interacting or working in concert together, right? Or or are you um, like you had asked earlier in the in the in the talk, um, you know you can now go to a terpene company, right, and get a blend that mimics uh, the taste of um lemon haze or lemon head right yeah well right and so um i i am 100 percent certain that there is a toxic dose that you do not want to have but i don't know what that is and this is this is um you know i this is where i praise the the true um uh pharmacologist yeah. right uh, this is what they study dose response and um there there is a dose response and so that's what makes this i think I, it's as a scientist, it's fascinating, but it's difficult because you're no longer working with one compound, one indication, right? You're working with a number of compounds, how they interact and how they're interacting with that indication. And then back to the endocannabinoid system, your 
personal endocannabinoid system. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like uh, there is some variability. Maybe you have more receptors or less, less receptors, uh, depending on what you're working, you know, this indication, this condition, you know, uh, so it, it can get, it gets, it's really, it can get complicated, uh, right? And I just it's learned a new term. Complicated, that, that, was, that was one of, one of my, uh, I, I think if I went back to college now, you know, uh, I would I would take different courses, you know, and and, and I was on or with a with a doctor this 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 morning, and he went back and got his PhD, you know, 10, 12 years ago, and and uh, you know, and I said, God, it's never too late. It's never too late. You being a, a molecular biology research, and at the beginning of your bio, you said something about um, beyond the lab bench, and I said, Oh, let me get back to that. So is that <laughs> Field, field research outside getting out of lab, is that your definition? Uh, so uh, wet lab scientists are people like me who spent their lab with a pipetter and, yeah. you know, looking looking in a test tube and uh, yeah. doing doing lots of things down on a bench. And so when I say beyond the bench, I say, and, and uh, uh, getting beyond the, uh, being at the bench, doing the actual research of, you know, in the latter years of my life, I've, I've done some computational biology um, and which is the field of kind of bioinformatics and so looking at full, whole genomes or utilizing uh, scripting and uh, programming actually to be able to pull down large amounts of, of data to answer your question. Yeah. Um, so when I say beyond the bench, I say beyond the bench like computational biology. I also say beyond the bench because um, there have been uh, certain positions where I've been directing the group and I'm no longer at the bench, yeah. right? And then the startup world where um, I've also been beyond the bench in that I've uh, uh, founded a number of uh, terpene as well as non-terpene startups. <laughs> um, <Good>. So <laughs> yeah. let's, let's talk about, I was, that's, that was one of my questions there. Where, how do they find you? Uh, where do they learn to go about terpenes? I mean, clearly, you know, th this is uh, you right. know, the passion uh, for, for, uh, is terp are terpenes considered elements? What would they consider be? They're compounds. They're compounds, small molecules. Good. So okay. they're, so they're the size. They're actually, I mean, so, so they're some terpenes because again, they're this big, large class, right? So, um, they're the size of a caffeine molecule, uh, kind of, right? That, small monoterpenes and stuff. So monoterpenes I don't drink coffee. Almost, I had a cup of coffee today and it was delicious. So. I know I, I've, I've given a, not this talk before, but I've started trying, I'm trying to, you know, if, if I have another scientist here, they're not exactly, exactly the same, but it gives you an idea. If you've, you, we've all looked at a caffeine molecule and they're yeah. just like a big ring with something on it. Right. So monoterpene is the size of a caffeine molecule. And then if you have a, a sesquiterpene, so things like caryophylline or humulene, there are these C15 carbon compounds that get a little bit bigger. Vitamin A is a terpene. That is a C20 compound, right? So they're the size of, if you go look at vitamin A, it's the size of essentially a diterpene type compound. And then we can keep getting larger. But still, in general, those are considered small molecules and a lot of drug discovery yeah. uh, is based on, you know, what we call small molecules. No, no wonder your dad loves having these conversations with you. <laughs> where, where, where are you on the pecking order with you and your, you have three siblings, right? The four of you? Yeah, there's three. Uh, there's four of us. I'm, I'm number three out of four. Um, three out of four. Gotcha. I, I am the only one that has a, you know, a doctor's degree. Aside from <laughs> and I bet you remind them that every, every day too, huh? Well, it, my, both, my, both my parents are doctors, so it's doctor, oh, gotcha. doctor, and gotcha. doctor trap at this point. So doctor, meet the third. Doctor. Doctor. Dr. Doctor and Dr. Trapp. Yeah. Um, so where do they find you? Where can people where right. can follow, yeah. so follow, I have, follow find you? And you've I written and you've written papers and you're getting ready, hopefully cross our fingers doing a TED talk as well. And so uh, okay. Susan's busy, yeah. everyone. So Susan is busy. And so that's why I wanted to, you know, I love I love sharing uh, uh, spotlighting some great people and you're you're definitely one of them. And so go on. Well, thank 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 you, John. Um so I have two websites. One is uh uh, for, for giving speaking engagements, that type of thing, Susan uh, You can go to that website and um, 
uh, if you want me to come and give a talk for your dispensary or a conference, uh, that's the place to do it. But I've also founded a company called terpedia.com. And we are developing a premier knowledge base of uh, terpene information. So it's sound science. What we're trying to do is curate uh, the terpene data, some of what we are talking about today. Again, so the cannabis industry is nascent, it's young, it's heard about terpenes. Uh, and what we're trying to do is actually have one place where if you're someone uh, creating a product formulation, you want to add terpenes to it, you want to make sure that you're, you know, you've got sound science uh, data behind you, not necessarily a clinical trial, but uh, then we can start to go back to the scientific literature, understand for that specific indication, for example, maybe uh, pain or inflammation, a gel, and adding terpenes to it, we'll be able to really dial in uh, uh, the, the dosing, which is what everybody wants to know. Yeah, that's what I was getting at earlier about different yeah. ailments, the benefits that people yeah. have with ailments. And so I know there are a lot of them that you were just mentioning. On your site too, and maybe there's another uh, uh, ad, side business you can put on there, will you sell terpenes or are you basically just education and this is what it is? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, um, I think it's too early for me to talk about. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but um, we, we, we are hoping to potentially, uh, what we want to do is do precise, uh, terpenes. So yeah. what we want to be able to dial in the dosing. And, and as a scientist, you have to start with the literature, read what's there, what was used, what was used in an animal model. And then, um, uh, you know, people are already using, right, terpenes and, and cannabis for all kinds of things. So it's, it's a little bit of uh, backward, uh, you know, back, uh, back validation, like yeah. going back, seeing what, what, you know, the chemo profile of the terpenes and, and uh, adding a little more to create, you know, uh, I don't want to say an ideal formula, but an improved formula for whatever, whatever conditions that, that they're, they're focused on. Right. So we're, we're trying to bring the sound science to the terpene industry within cannabis. <laughs> well, we, we need you. And, I, and, and uh, you know, because, you know, I've learned a lot here today, but I learned a lot from you when when we uh, when I interviewed you a few months back. Again, not knowing there were over fifty five thousand different terpenes. I mean that that alone. And just so, in nature, just say in nature, in not nature. not in the can not, not in the, the cannabis, cannabis plant, industry, yeah, and not in, and in, not in, in plants in general. But yeah, there's one of the largest class of natural products in nature. So writing it down in my notes. Uh, and I'll put all your links on the site here as well. And, uh, but Susan, always a pleasure. I can't thank you enough. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, John. And um, you want to hold up your paper too that people can find? Are you, are you ready to oh. announce that or not yet? Um, uh, well, I, I, Never mind. I was. <laughs> well, you I, tell I me, I don't want, I don't, I don't want to put you on the spot. No, no I, I have an article coming out in Terpene and Testing Magazine, and that's going to be focused on terpenes and the cytokine storm. So, uh, uh, that'll be January, February issue unless. So uh, when, when that, when that comes out, send me the link and I'll put it out there uh, for our, our viewers as well. And, uh, and I'll put all your links on our, thank on you our so much. podcast as well. But, uh, Susan, I, I appreciate it and, uh, stay healthy. I know Susan is an athlete and she just had one of her knees worked on. And so yes. keep moving, keep moving. That's right. And, yes. uh, thank you. Blessings to you and, and we will see you again. And everyone, John Malanke with the United Patient Group, be informed and be well. And as I say, stop and smell the roses. Have a good oh, day. Yeah. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. John Malanke with the United Patients Group. Be informed and be well. This segment is brought to you by Aspen Green. Aspen Green is just a handful of USDA, that's right, USDA certified organic hemp and CBD brands and all of its hemp is grown from the perfect topography and climate found in Colorado. It is a family-owned business and is deeply committed to the science of providing only the purest hemp and CBD products for the best results and most beneficial experience. Its mission is to bring the therapeutic value of pure, organic hemp and CBD to people who seek supplemental relief through the use of healthy, natural products. Aspen Green is free from toxins, and runs up to eight different lab tests from bona fide third-party labs throughout its product line. It holds in high regard three foundational principles that guide every aspect of their business, actions, and interactions with their customers, partners, as well as their community. 
These are quality, integrity, and transparency. These will always remain at the hearts of their efforts to bring their beneficial products to consumers. Check out why purity matters at aspengreen.com and follow them on social channels at aspengreencbd. Use promo code UPGCBD for 20% off. Again, UPGCBD for 20% off at aspengreen.com.